because we make fun of archaeology. And we also do dinosaurs. Yes, we also do dinosaurs. Looking just to Welcome to another ball. incredibly amazing yes, episode of Goblin Logical Fantasies. I have as our yes, guest do Dr. Emma Yasui, a leading expert in Jomon period starch analysis. <laughs> we talked about this before recording. <laughs> I well, okay. This it's a little bit of a niche topic. But yeah. that's just because she's the, she's on the cutting edge of research, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. one of the few, but I'm still <laughs> early days, so I get a little weirded out by being called leading or cutting edge. <laughs> Getting to the topic at hand. Um, yeah. So I say Jomon, so uh-huh. some of the audience might not even know what that is. Okay, so totally we're going to explain. Fair. Yeah, we're going to explain <laughs> what that is. And... It comes from Japan, and so I think we also have to explain a little bit about Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Japan is a place. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> Not that basic? Okay. <laughs> well, well, at least for myself, when I think about it, especially when I'm sort of thinking about the way that people like stereotypically think about Japan, I think most people, when they think about Japan, they're really sort of thinking about the Warring States period, right? Sure, they, they're think, they're yeah. thinking like samurai. Um. But the thing is, though, this is this is much much earlier. This is like prehistoric time, and oh, yeah. more importantly, or what's relevant to this case here is that your your research happened in Hokkaido, which is the north part of Japan. Mm-hmm. For the audience, to remember that Japan is kind of like banana shaped or like boomerang shaped, and that one end basically touches Korea, and the other end touches the Sakhalin Island, which is Russia, Siberia. The southern extent actually goes down to Taiwan, and then. Part of the main island ducks toward the Korean Peninsula, and then yeah, up toward the top, you're getting into what is currently Russian territory with the Kuriles and Sakhalin and uh, Kamchatka. Yeah, and I I just wanted to point that out because I think that's a little bit important. If we happen to match, mention Yayoi and like the migration patterns that brought yeah. people out to Japan, okay. But so go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. That Explain is, to us with Jamon. That is a massive misconception is that Japanese history, yeah, starts with some of the samurai stuff, and that it's all across what is now modern Japan, but, like, modern borders and nation-states are like I said, like, modern constructs, so what happens where in Japanese prehistory can be tricky, but luckily for the Jomon period, it's one of the few prehistoric periods that we find sites all across what is currently considered Japan, which is really cool because that's really widespread for a period that started around 16,000 years ago and starts to end or disappear around 2,000 years ago. So super long period covering a lot of space, but a lot of evidence of some cultural similarities. So elements of their society and the things that they made and used are similar enough that we still consider it all to be Jomon. So regional differences, but single appears to be single culture. Yeah. That, that's kind of interesting. Cause I mean, even in California, right. Um, if you go, um, cause I'm in California, <laughs> if you go yeah. to like North, <laughs> Northern California, reaching up toward like Oregon, right. That's one, that's a pretty distinct culture from like Southern California, with like the Serrano tribe and the Coahuila tribe, um, mm. so, but you're saying the Jomon across Japan. I'm, I'm referencing California because um, the main island of Japan, Honshu, is about the same land area as California. But yeah. you're saying that it's kind of similar across the whole thing. Similar enough archaeologically. Now, what that would look like every day is harder because, yeah, the these communities were living from any place that was like subtropical all the way up to subarctic so very different places different islands uh we talked about how parts of japan are closer to other parts of the continent and other islands like different groups that they were in contact with on a regular basis and i think that's another major misconception about the japanese past is that because of the sengoku period and a bunch of that and tokugawa people think japan had developed in isolation and it certainly did not but that's kind of that's kind of going sideways. The Jomon yeah. period <laughs> is oh. super cool and very long and very spread out, and the people are very diverse, which 
makes it really complicated. And that's why I'm always like, I work in Hokkaido. I work in <laughs> the northernmost island. And even then I work in the southern part of that. So that's even different from the northern part of Hokkaido. Past is past is complicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, the world's a lot bigger than what people sort of imagine it to be. Um, now, I think, I don't know if I, I misread this in your dissertation, but you were trying to make a distinction between Chomon period, Chomon culture, and Chomon hunter-gatherers? Yes. So that's kind of, I don't know if that's so relevant to you, the public, but that is <laughs> something happening within academic publication. And I think that the words that we choose are important. So that's probably why I went off about that for a bit. Uh, because for the longest time, we talked about it being a period. So, you know, a span of time where things are shared enough to be considered a bit of what would be known as a culture period where, you know, there's enough in common. And I prefer to say Jomon culture just because it is these seemingly shared traits across regions, despite diversity. But in recent times, people have really focused on calling them hunter gatherers, which to me is a type of economy and defining a whole group of people and how they live simply by their economy is not my jam. Yeah. I mean, like that's the whole point of your dissertation is right. It's not, is that there's people are making, mechanically doing a certain thing like they're yeah. doing certain things there's a certain um a factor of efficiency for why they're doing it mm -hmm. but you're, you're trying to add in that human element like they're doing this because they want to they feel like it there there's some other thing that's not captured in just yeah. yeah it's like if we described every modern person as just a capitalist like here we are north american capitalists it's like oh does that really capture what people's lives are about and how they think of themselves and what's getting lost when we just refer to a whole group by the way they get resources, you know? Yeah. I guess I'm a capitalist, but I'm giving this podcast away for free. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're not a great capitalist. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I guess this is the reason why you make a decision between subsistence and food waste. Like what, what is food waste? Yeah. Uh, so it's a bit of a made up word, but <laughs> <laughs> Aren't all that's, made up? <laughs> that's academia for you. But I do like the idea of food ways or food practices. And in some ways that removes some discussion about like crafting and medicine, but I prefer it over some terms like diet and subsistence because it makes it more of a social practice rather than an economic one again. But I think I said in my dissertation to you, I got problems with the word subsistence because of our concept of subsisting. Like when we talk about people in the past subsistence, it kind of has this connotation of survival. And when we talk about it with hunter gatherers, there's this Western centric old fashioned idea that hunter gatherers are just kind of scraping by just bare minimum subsisting and I I just like to get away from that word and look at what people were doing not just to live and survive but also to enjoy life and interact with each other yeah I I know there, there's some um, perhaps some uh, limitations to the hypothesis that uh, that when people migrated into the Americas that that was a cause of um, the deaths or the extinction of large mammal species in North America. Oh yeah. The megafauna extinction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now I, I'm going to believe in that just for one reason or, well, I was reading a little bit of um, like, I don't know, like a blog or a little like a science article. Um, and that they were pointing out that some went extinct more quickly than other species. Mm -hmm. And so for myself as a personal belief, just cause I, I think it's funny. I'd like to think that some of those animals were tastier than other animals. And those are the ones that went extinct faster. <laughs> it's very possible. <laughs> like, uh, it's really sad, but like there are a bunch of turtle species, like even the Galapagos turtles kind of went extinct because people thought they were delicious. <laughs> Uh, Dar uh, Darwin included. He was one of the guys who ate them. So, like, <laughs> think about that. 
But you know, there's some really kooky theories about the megafauna extinction. So <laughs> tastiness would not be the kookiest one out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so, so so lay it on us. And what? Okay, so, so this is this is the thing that I, I, I guess talking about subsistence and what people ate like in the ancient past. It's le- like in popular imagination, uh-huh. people think that they just ate meat or whatever, like the paleo diet, whatever that's supposed to be. I know, I know, uh... and, and I'm like the paleo diet, like, no starch, and like here you are, Doctor Yasui. We're all about starches in the ancient diet. <laughs> so yeah, because oh, I have oh, my students have to hear this all the time, and random go, people who bring go, this up. Do it, but do it, do it. <laughs> there are parts of the like capital P paleo diet, the popular diet that are fine. Uh, lower like. Machine processed foods, cool, less sugar, and uh, kind of, okay, controlling the amount of carbs that you take in, fine. These these are all fine, but you don't need to go to evolution or genetics or the human past to say that these things are worth doing, especially since a lot of it is just incorrect. Like, (laughs) we have evolved to process starch. Uh, you actually start breaking starch down in your mouth and your saliva. There are special enzymes in there that go to work immediately. Uh, We can't actually digest protein very well without having some form of starch to help fuel that process. That's why you go into something like ketosis. Breaking down meats actually has a lot of dangerous byproducts. And taking in other starches, minerals, and other things help your body deal with that so we know just based on how this whole this i was about to call it a meat machine how this whole body (laughs) thing works for us requires a balance and plants and starchy foods are totally part of that and then on top of that we have all of this evidence from the stuff like i do residues and microscopic work that show even human ancestors like homo erectus and neanderthals were eating a lot of plants and starchy things And this idea that I've seen pictures even that say Homo sapiens are carnivores and we most certainly are not. That's (laughs) so so weird. It's such a, it's, and it's really unusual to think why would we want to be classified as carnivores because the biology doesn't support that. So what is it socially or, you know, theoretically that makes that appealing? Like, that's I, random I, random thoughts from Emma, but no, the- no, 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 no. I think that's perfect because the thing is, okay. So the question that I, I think we need, all need to sort of describe to people is what the Jomo people eat, and it is more than just nuts. But so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of everything, and seasonally, but also they had a lot of storage technology, like drying and. Uh, We see salt production, so we know they were pickling and salting things, fermenting. So all year round, they had access to a lot of different things and were eating it. Uh, And I don't entirely know. I know I put a lot of it in my dissertation and in my work about this popular belief that the Jomong people focused on nuts. Uh, And... Part of this, I think, is comparison to some of the California indigenous groups that for a long time were thought to have subsisted on acorns. And I say subsisted intentionally because that was kind of the idea. But yeah, there's either way, there's this idea that the Jobon ate a lot of tree nuts, like walnuts, acorns, chestnuts. uh, And this was the base of their diet, like a staple. And... A lot of it was said to be done through the stone tools that I look at. So processing those nuts, they're like, they must have been crushing them and grinding them up. So clearly that would be done on stone tools. And there are a lot of these stone tools. So they must have been processing a lot of nuts and nuts must have been important. And I just find that hard to believe. First of all, no one should ever live entirely off of nuts. Unless they're a squirrel. Unless they're a squirrel. And even then you need some greens and other things. (laughs) Uh, The types of nuts and things differ a little, but in 
in general, it's not a really good base for a diet, let alone the primary aspect of your diet. I think it's a fun idea. Nuts are easy to see. The trees are beautiful. Nuts are tasty. You can put them into a lot of like fun tourist products like cookies and trail mix and that. So I think it's just this little bit of archaeological evidence that nuts were used then being turned into a popular narrative and then academia and scholars then being kind of influenced by popular perceptions and it all just kind of got out of hand and so my dissertation really was me saying wait a minute well nuts have a lot of starch in them they should be super visible by using these relatively new methods in archaeology to look at residues and sort of separate the types of plants that might have been smashed up on these rocks. And so we can actually test this popular idea of how common nuts were and if these tools really are indicators of that sort of food way. Did I start rambling? I felt I feel like I started it, rambling it's, there. It's fine, Dr. Yossi. Like <laughs> I expect, like, okay, I am trying to inter interview experts on this stuff, yeah. and I expect every single one of them to just go off for, like, 10, 15 minutes, and I'm along for the ride. Yeah, you're, you're <laughs> just, you're stuck in here with us. <laughs> I cut down my paleo diet rants for okay. the people out there. There's plenty of critique and critical evaluation of that, so I don't need to do that. The... Talk about nuts, I don't think is that relevant to a lot of people in North America, so. <laughs> but I want them to know about it, because things pop up and it's a good detail. I guess one of the bigger points to take away from this that's applicable anywhere uh, is the tendency to oversimplify people's lives in the past. So saying that the Jamon ate primarily nuts there are versions of that in other parts of the world where it's like, oh, people in the past primarily ate this or that. They survived on that. And it's like, well, that's really too simple because you think about eating that way. And they had other things available. So why would they eat that way? And I guess that kind of connects to the idea of paleo diet being mostly meat. It's like, why though? Meat's the hardest thing to get. It's the hardest thing to digest. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, this is going to be me kind of complaining about meat, okay? Like, me personally, I don't think meat tastes that great. Yo, At least it. not in the sense of the way that a lot of Americans do it, which is to put like a 16-ounce steak, you know, a pound of meat, and then sure. grill it, and then eat it straight, you know, maybe some mm -hmm. pepper or salt or whatever. And like, that to me doesn't feel like a very good meal, because it's the same thing that you're just shoveling into your face. And the thing, the other thing is, that's a very, very specific cut of the animal. Sure. Generally speaking, is mm -hmm. if you take all the time and effort to catch the thing, you're going to eat as much of it as you can. Semi kind of tangentially related was a Golden Kamui, which is a, a recent manga that takes place, well, it's, that's like 1900s, 1890s. Yeah, it's after the Japanese Russo War. But it happens in Hokkaido, and then there's a character in there who's uh, Ainu. Yeah. Um, and at least in the first volume, they capture some squirrels. I'm like, okay, eating squirrels. And then they happen mm -hmm. to eat squirrel brains and they eat them raw. I thought it was a little bit funny. You know, that's just more typical, right? You're going to eat more of the animal. My dad likes fish eyeballs and stuff like that. And I know when I eat a small enough fish, I yeah. eat the whole thing, like tail to head, um, bones and everything. So yeah, it's a little bit weird, you know, when I think of people eating yeah. just the meat. There's some interesting work done about this idea of the paleo diet, and then also the connection between preferences and the nutrients that you get out of your food. So our, our bodies and our minds are super connected in a really funny way. And they found that if you don't find a meal appealing, you're less likely to actually even process it properly. Like you don't draw the same amount of nutrients out of it. It's really strange. <laughs> Can I explain all the sides behind that? Absolutely not. That's not what I do. But it's just 
to say that things are really complicated. Also for a lot of meats, what we're actually wanting out of that is the fats, not the protein itself. So the flavor is in the fat. If you've ever had just like a straight up dry chicken breast, it tastes like almost nothing. It's more texture. Which is actually, and that fattiness you can actually supplement with like seeds and nuts, right? Like I really like uh, sesame seed oil. That's great. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Nuts are very oily. I have a long chunk in my dissertation talking about why we might not even want to use stone tools to process nuts because they are so oily and then you just make a mess of everything and lose all of your <laughs> your actual meal. I think this was kind of interesting. Okay, so we're going to get more into the technical things. Yeah. Of what you did in for your research was, is you had these stone tools mm-hmm. and then you tested them for whatever, for if they possessed, if there was starches on them. Yeah. And um, so you can explain that in more detail. But what I thought was really interesting um, in in terms of your, your that criticism of uh, Chomon using a lot of nuts is that you have pictures of museum displays that had yes. basically like a mortar pestle um, yep. setup. And if you grind nuts in that kind of setup, you end up getting this layer, this like, you know, gunky, yeah. oily, dark layer on it. And when I looked at those stone tools in your in your research, I'm like, I don't see any of that staining. No. Nope. It's, there are a few, but it's rare, and there are so many reasons why it might not be there, but that's kind of a big conclusion of my dissertation and other people's work in Starch too. If that stuff was smashed into the surface, it kind of doesn't matter what happens in between. We should find some trace of it. And I really didn't find any clear traces of that kind of nut processing or those activities it was yeah there was nothing obvious so you can't really tell me that those tools were being (laughs) used (laughs) primarily for nuts and i'll be stubborn until someone shows me better evidence or i see it myself (laughs) but yeah also those photos that i showed those are actual jomon artifacts they're not even reproductions made for the museums Oh, really? There's so many of these artifacts. They're so common. And up until now, they've been of so little use like for analysis that, yeah, those are just straight up artifacts. I find that hilarious that they pulled this 10,000-year-old rock out of the ground, put it in a museum, like display, put yeah. walnuts in it, encourage like, kids to mash the nuts smash into it. Smash them up. Well, they're not going to break them, that's for sure. <laughs> but... <laughs> To be fair, the ones that in those pictures are probably more like four, three to four thousand years old, but still, yeah, they uh, they just let the general public have at it, and it is really meant for kids. It's hard to do. Yeah, I'm surprised kids don't smash their fingers while doing that. But yeah, there's there's wild buildup on the tools and questions about what like whether you would even want to mash them up or do these things and i think that's some of those are some of the practical questions that go missing along the way that i really like looking at like what does this actually look like (laughs) i don't remember the 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 video name or whatever but here's another reference to a california um, indigenous people so back in like the 1940s or 30s Mm-hmm. Like the national, I can't remember. Um, one of the the science administrations in the U.S. government um, was going around and recording things, just video recording things, and they happened to record a, an indigenous woman like harvesting acorns and drying and processing the acorns all the way through the whole, you know, stop the uh, beginning to end mm-hmm. um, until she had the cakes at the end. Yeah. And so it was really interesting to see that and. And uh, I'm there is some rock smashing, but not that much rock smashing. <laughs> yeah. And other people who work in sew tools, well, a fun thing to do is experiment. Just do it yourself. See what happens. But I'm also going to say here, don't just eat nuts off of trees because they will hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the species, especially around North America, require a lot of processing or just aren't meant to be eaten. So don't do it. But, yeah, I, you know. I, I tried to do it myself, 
that oh. I, I I know I didn't process the acorns enough. So when I, I bit into the little cake, I'm like, this is super bitter. I spat yeah. it out and threw it away. And I'm like, oh, yeah. yeah. That bitterness <laughs> is telling you not to consume it. It's tannins. <laughs> acorns in particular are the worst. So yeah. Anyways, a lot of processing that needs to be done. And for something like acorns, you actually have to dry roast and what we call leaching. So soak them for a long time in a very specific pH. So usually I think more basic than acidic and let it sit there for days, if not a week or more before you can even dry them and grind them up. Yeah. The, the video I saw, the, the process was um, the woman made this, it was a little bit like a silo. Um, like oh, it yeah. was like like a little I don't know it was like two trees or a couple like pieces of wood standing up yep, and yep. it was fairly tall like eight feet tall uh like the, what's that like two and a half meters um and it and there's like a basket structure or whatever filled filled like you're you're talking like hundreds of pounds of acorns just shoved yeah. in there yeah um, and it sat there for days to dry brought them out cracked them and then took the meat and boiled them the yeah. the meat inside water for a little while and then yeah. from there smashed it and made into cakes so there's quite a bit of process and a lot of the time that water would be mixed with ash like wood ash to change the balance of the water too but yeah and when just cracking things open or grinding it up it's a very mechanical process and there's a lot of talk too about well if you smash the shell on a thing you get a bit you get bits of those shell in the meat of the nut itself and if you grind the nuts on the surface after the shell is taken off, you get little bits of the stone in there too. And a lot of the times you don't want that. So there you can either do things like line your stone with big leaves or hides so you don't get so much stuff included. And that means we wouldn't see it on the stone. Or you use other materials like wood. A lot of the Ainu of northern Japan used wooden mortars and pestles for a lot of their processing. So wood doesn't survive as well in the archaeological record, but I think it's just as likely that Jomon people were making wooden things or using pottery of different sorts to process. And it wasn't all just stones. Uh, we, we didn't actually list like specific things that um, they they ate. I'm gonna actually see if I can pull up your dissertation. Right oh, now, you want a <laughs> you want a full list? Well, <laughs> I want That's... the whole diet. Okay, because <laughs> the thing is, okay, it's a lot though because it changes by season. It's different in every region. But or are you talking about Kobayashi's uh, seasonal calendar? Yeah, yeah, the seasonal calendar. I saw because he had that little picture, or whatever, in your yeah. Dissertation. That's a classic. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> This is, yes. So the Jomon calendar proposed by Kobayashi, 1977, 1986. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to like read off some of the things that are on here. Uh, well, I'm going to actually say what they are in English because it's all it's in Japanese. But here we go. We got boar, we got deer, we got monkey, we got uh, tanuki, flying squirrel, rabbits, um, chestnuts, walnuts. We have salmon, we have sea bream, that's a tie. We have fugu, we have skipjack, we have sardines, mm -hmm. and we have like seal, sea lions, and nobiru, is that onion? Warabi and zenmai? Warabi is the, our ferns. They're like fiddleheads, yeah. And then they also have dolphin and whale. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, all that oysters and clams. And, no birds? Oh, yeah, snails. There's no birds on this one. Huh. But yeah, a little bit of everything. And not all of that would be everywhere. So I think Kobayashi proposed primarily for like central Honshu. I see. Which is wild because they wouldn't be necessarily doing as much sea lion and whaling as in the north, like far north. But yeah, it was a general idea based on little to nothing at the time that... The seasons would change and the resources available would change. So diet was seasonal. That's not a bad idea, but saying what was available in those seasons and what was actually used, that's something that needed to be tested and wasn't really worked out at the time. So he proposed that in the seventies and people have been working for decades saying like, the idea is fine, but let's fill in the details. So this is what that calendar looks like in different places and at different points of the period. And uh, plants are very much a greater part of that. 
and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's obviously something that doesn't apply across the whole like over ten thousand years and the entirety of the islands. But like they ate a, they ate just about everything, and it is fun. The fugu or the puffer fish. There are a lot of sites in central Japan where people were eating a lot of it. And <laughs> that's the one that is the famous joke from The Simpsons. Like, this is the fish that if you process it incorrectly, you will poison yourself. And there's no real antidote. Well, people had that figured out like 8,000 years ago <laughs> in parts of Japan and were eating copious amounts of fugu. Okay, I, okay so here's going to be my comment on it. So it's it's not so much that the processing is wrong is so much that what it is is that there's like a liver or a poison sack or whatever yeah, if you cut it the wrong way yeah you're supposed to cut just enough of it so you get like a tingling feeling or whatever in your mouth mm -hmm. but if you just like screw it and just cut the tail and then just throw the rest away you're fine i've, I've had like fugu tail before oh yeah oh yeah the jamon were eating everything all over the place at different times different ways I, what you'll mostly find in my dissertation is a long list of plants. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that, that's what I wanted to get to. Is so, so we have all these different things, and you have all these plants. It's like, how did you know that you were looking at a plant from Jomon period and not a plant from today? Oh, that's an ongoing issue in residues in general, but starch in particular, because starch is everywhere. Lucky for me, some of the ones I can rule out that are really common in like factory processes now, corn starch. Well, there's no corn in the Jomon <laughs> period. Uh, and it's a very distinct starch. Uh, so even anything resembling corn automatically gets crossed off as potential contamination. And then that whole sample is suspect. Another big one is potato starch, because that will show up in a lot of foods. And tapioca will be in some like hair products and hand soaps and laundry detergents. A lot of stuff just has gratuitous starch in it that you don't know about until you have to start doing this work. <laughs> I, when I read that line in your dissertation, I'm just like, the image in my mind was some guy coming up behind you eating a bag of potato chips and like asking, hey, yeah. what you doing? <laughs> yeah, you can, you can even get starch on something by breathing on it too hard or <laughs> sneezing on it, like uh bumblebees going by can scatter starch on things you know like there's there are methods for determining whether or not it is archaeological versus modern contamination not just the species but its appearance uh we do a lot of control checks so sampling from different places uh traps set up around the lab space to catch airborne starch um, I've done traps in labs before that come back with a lot of mold in them. So I'm just like, bad news, guys. You got mold somewhere in this lab. <laughs> but also like high risk of ruining my samples. So we got to take care of that. Uh. Oh, rice is another one. Uh, there, There isn't rice in the Jomon period until really close to the end of the period. And so if you're working on something earlier, if you have rice starch, it's most likely contamination. So yeah, <laughs> there's there are a lot of ways, but it's case by case. You see a starch, you're like, tell me about yourself. And you look for all of the evidence you can. And you make a best estimate based on your experience and all of these indicators. And yeah. I've heard you talk about this before. And I, I read like, you know, the, the beginning and the end of your dissertation. I'm like, okay, yeah, you're identifying starches. I hadn't realized what you actually did to identify them. I thought you were doing some sort of chemical thing, like you're testing for DNA or whatever. No, but that's not I what just, you're doing. I just look at them real close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I sit at a microscope for hours. I look at things. You kind of like poke at the slide to make them roll around. You put them under different lights. You can do chemical, but I don't. I just look at them. I was just like looking at the pictures and looking at the description. You're like, okay, you're looking at... The, the shape of the starch, uh -huh. the center of the starch, yep. the lining of the starch, and then uh -huh. like the grooves, how it makes a cross shape on the starch. And I'm like, yeah. that's what you stare at for hours and hours a day. Don't your yeah. eyes hurt? Absolutely. I actually, <laughs> I get uh, motion sick more than anything else. Well, first, okay. So if you've ever sat at your computer for a long time and then gone outside, your eyes don't always know how to focus into the distance. 
imagine that, but like even worse because microscopes, you're usually looking anywhere between like 200 to 400 times magnification at one spot. But yeah, things move around a lot at that level. (laughs) And everything's set in water on the slide so that it can still move and rehydrate if you need to. It just makes the optics better. But that means everything kind of like moves around, like, you know, along the shore when you watch the water come in and out, everything's always kind of moving. And I get motion sick. So I have to take breaks. Every once in a while, I'm sitting completely still looking at a microscope. I'm like, I'm going to hurl. I need to sit. I need to stop looking. (laughs) It does help that if you wear glasses, you just take your glasses off and you can make things adjust as needed. So my eyes don't necessarily hurt, but I do get really barfy feeling if I do it for too long. (laughs) Yeah. People have come in and asked me questions. I'm like, hold on. Okay. Not going to barf. What is your question? (laughs) Just fair warning. If anyone wants to do microscopy, there's a whole lot that could go on. (laughs) Oh, Oh, Okay. No, that that is exactly what we want on this show, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my okay. Goodness. Then to sort of kind of wrap up question for this is is just why this specifically? Like why Jomon, why Hokkaido, why Stone Tools rather than un rather than another time period or sure. ceramics or, or poop coprolites? Coprolites. Coprolites are really cool. If I had the chance, I would. Ceramics are a meh for me. No, (laughs) ceramics are cool, but I don't want to do analysis on them. Okay, but I'll start. First of all, those questions were asked to me by my Japanese colleagues a few days after I arrived in Japan for the first time. Mm -hmm. They're like, why? why? Why are you here? Why are you interested? And, uh, I feel like a lot of people that do research, sometimes you just kind of start and then you figure out the why after. Okay. And in some ways, like in my undergrad, I heard so much about other parts of the world, but because I am mixed Japanese and wasn't hearing about Japan, that kind of sparked my curiosity and I started looking at stuff myself. Uh, And then I found out there's someone who works on Japanese archaeology at the University of Toronto. So I applied for my master's and his specialty was the Jobon period of Northern Japan. So that's kind of how the region and the period really were given to me as a starting point. And I really fell in love with all of it. So that is lucky in a lot of ways, but also there are just so many questions for the Jomo period. And they're slightly different questions in the North than they are in the South. And I think there's a lot going on in the North that doesn't get talked about a lot. So that also drew me to it. Cause you want, you want your own space, right? You kind of need that gap in the research that you could find interesting, but also worthwhile and then start to contribute. So that's kind of why I stuck with what was initially proposed by my supervisor based on his experience. And now why he did anything, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Lost to the sands of time. Uh, yeah, that's that's how I got into it. And then my methods, like, again, stone tools are understudied. There were a lot of assumptions and not a lot of research. And I'm like, well, there are solutions to that. And again, I took classes in undergrad on archaeological microscopy, so working with highly magnified things. And one of my teachers was a starch specialist, Carney Matheson. And he kind of started me off on this whole, it's like a puzzle. You have all of these little microscopic bits and pieces, and you have to kind of put everything together to understand what not just a whole society, but maybe what one person was doing that day. And that's really interesting to me. So Hmm. somebody was preparing a meal or preparing medicine or craft supplies on this one tool. And 
it's very personal and I like that. So I don't know. It's kind of like opportunities were presented. I took them and had a good time with it and now plan to continue, you know, not everyone has that experience, but I wouldn't say I just fell into it. I, like I said, took opportunities and it all worked out. And here you are. And here I am. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) All the way around again. Uh, Okay. So ostensibly this podcast is really sort of me kind of mining expertise for my world building. And I, I, which is that said that, that that last part you said, right? Like there's something very personal that someone uh, with this object on a particular day with this particular food, like you know, made a meal. Yeah. Um, I think that's really interesting in, in like, this is a little bit of a kind of a, s- a side thing, but like in manga, that's a really, really like anime too, but, but that's something that's really particular about how, how, uh, information is depicted and, and um, Mm-hmm. rendered in a manga is that you take the time to look at each aspect of the situation yeah. um scott mcleod does talks about that in his uh, understanding comics book that idea of you're presenting it you're taking the time to be like okay here's the cutting board here are the yeah. marks in the wood where you cut it here is sort of like the rag that was used to clean up the mess like mm-hmm. all of that process coming up to the meal um i think that's really interesting and it's you know, it's, it's kind of, it has a real like emotional touch to it. So. It does. And in contrast to a lot of the existing work up until this time, where to be fair, the methods wouldn't really allow you to do more than say whether a species, a plant or animal was there or not. We can start looking at actually how those things were used or if they were. Just because something in the region was good to eat doesn't mean the Jabon people thought they were good to eat or were seeking them out. And it also doesn't tell us how they made them edible or how they shared it with each other. So yeah, starting to look really closely at the tools, like we can start to ask those questions and see if we can answer them. Hmm. But yeah, I love food. (laughs) (laughs) I now love the Jabon period and... (laughs) <laughs> these weird little blobs that tell me about what they were eating. I, I am going to put as much starches in Welcome to Goblin Town as much as I can in honor of your work, Dr. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you can have like a goblin investigator finding this evidence of starch. Yeah. Well, no, I was going to put, um, because you, you list a bunch of starches and the other thing is like you give like the scientific names in your dissertation. So I get lost real quickly in that list. Oh, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like there's a lot of starches to use, and your what, what is it? Underground storage organism. I'm like, can't you just Organs, call it a tuber? Yeah. <laughs> like, no, because a tuber is only one type of underground storage organ. <laughs> you can't do that. You have tubers and roots and corms. And <laughs> I realize that eventually. But... Bulbs are different. Yeah, no, it's a uh, the the goofy jargon that appears, but you it. Words are meaningful. We have to do these things. But there are so many different sources of starch that it's kind of endless, the the possibilities of what people were using and where they got it from. And I think that's what I'm going to have to do as I sort of develop things, is that when you see the house or the kitchen of an individual, you're going to see bulbs, roots, tubers, you know, yeah. grasses, flowers, everything, right? Like it has to be... Things are you know, drying. Yeah. We have a lot of ethnographic and archaeological evidence of uh, group activities. Like you bring in your crop or you harvest when a wild resource is ready and you will all as a village for several days work together to process it and store it. Like there's a lot of behavior around these things. And I think Gold- Golden Kamui does integrate food in a really good way it's not just a pause but it's also like the cause for a lot of how you live there's also a lot of poisons if you're looking for (laughs) game stuff especially with like roots and tubers uh these are parts of the plant that it wants to protect because it's essentially it's life insurance right like if it's a bad season it can draw on this over the winter it can draw on this if it wants to split it can create a larger plant 
So they have a lot of defense mechanisms and some of the most poisonous things that you can find are going to be in like roots and tubers. Okay, hold that thought. Hold that thought for, for when we actually plot to kill the players. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do that hard-hitting question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. You list some of your sites, and one of the sites you listed that you studied was at, or, or excavated at, was a uh, Hamanasuno. Hamanasuno, yeah. yeah. Hamanasuno. So I'm going to ask you. How much did you cry when you found all that research data from 1974 stored on floppy disks? Oh, they weren't even, yeah. They were coded in Fortran. It was, you know, so much just out of reach. <laughs> and you should see the look on my face. <laughs> Dude, like, archaeologists are used to disappointment, but, like, man, that stuff is just gone because of technological choices made in the recent past, you know? <laughs> so every time someone's like, here's this new technology, every archaeologist is going to be like, oh, no, but, like, <laughs> for how long? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know if I cried, but I certainly died a little inside. <laughs> I, I, I'm just wondering what your Japanese colleagues thought or what they were doing when they handed you the box or whatever. <laughs> oh, and I don't even think we had... I think the discs were at U of T. Oh. Japan does everything on paper still. Like, it's even hard to get a PDF. They, they print everything. So, yeah. They might have been laughing. I don't know. But... <laughs> They also, I think I wrote about this too. I started out my project just helping to reconstruct some work at those sites like Yagi and Hamanasano, where the U of T team had been involved, but then there was a fire in Japan in one of the storage facilities that oh no. wiped out their part of the records. And so my master's and my initial PhD was reconstructing some of that by being the go-between between between countries and institutions and kind of going back and looking at all of the actual artifacts and storage. So that was a mess, but yeah, data loss uh, for various reasons in archeology span is very real. And (laughs) yeah, you know, (laughs) for all of that lost data. I, I feel for you. I can just imagine you like opening up the shoebox and looking at it with it's inside of me like son of a and just like yeah. throwing it down. And you know, there are ways to get old technology running and then coding that data onto like a hard drive or something. We probably could have done it, but what was on those disks was also just the the creation and the process of a single academic. So it might not even have made sense to anyone else. (laughs) Someone else's database can be absolute nonsense to someone who didn't work on it. And unfortunately, that particular researcher died well before I was anywhere near university. So there was no one to even ask about what was on those disks and how to make sense of it. So, you know time but maybe in the future some archaeologists will find these discs <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be another archaeological artifact <laughs> absolutely it will be well i don't know <laughs> we'll see what time does to it okay plotting to kill the players you are welcome to plot and scheme with me sure okay so going back to poison is tubers <laughs> so um, many <laughs> that's the, it's the easy thing to do with plants right like those things can really mess you up okay so okay so there, there's two aspects here so if we're, if we're gonna like mess with the players then is, is one you have to somehow get them to eat it is one thing sure and then the other aspect is if they're poison what does that poison do to them so which which one do you think is more fun for you to talk about i think we can cover both pretty quickly. okay <laughs> So there are a lot of lookalikes in the plant world where 
one is edible and the other is not? Well, first of all, I should say they're all edible, but you can't digest all of them and some of them make you sick. So <laughs> let's not mistake being able to put it in your mouth with actually getting anything out of it. <laughs> but uh, there are yams that... And we think they intentionally mimic each other too. So one is perfectly safe to eat raw and the other will make you poop your brains out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an easy way for, <laughs> I think in a game or characters, but you don't actually kill them, but you make them incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> for <a while. laughs> if you make them uncomfortable, they have to role play that. So that's one thing. Yeah. I kind of want to up the stakes a little bit. Or it's a disadvantage <laughs> in combat. <laughs> well, even better. Let's make it even better. Yeah, let's see. have them being chased by a monster that depends on smell to find its prey. And here mm. you are doing a lot of number two. Yeah, leaving a scent trail everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of animal. Yeah, if you're... If you smell sick as well, like that might bring up particular kinds of predators. <sighs> okay. That's pretty good. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. Or you could I just like have that. vultures circling all the time because they think you're dying. <laughs> 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 just waiting. I didn't imagine a running sequence because then that also might mean like, how often do you stop for emergencies? <laughs> <laughs> Constitution check to make sure you don't um, soil yeah. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that feels particularly options. evil. It does, yeah, right? <laughs> You're gonna have to give me some okay, so you say yams, some 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 sort of potatoes do that. Okay. Are there any other plant species that you think are interesting to talk about? Um there are. If we're gonna go more fantasy. There's, I think this is cool. There's a whole type of plant that in order to spread its seeds, it coats its seeds in like a really sweet smelling coating that attracts insects. And so it gets ants to like come up, take its seeds and carry them underground and essentially plant them for it. So if we're going with like scent based predators, that could also be interesting if players huh. get their hands on some plant products or especially like seeds or something that, and they might not know this, but they attract big bug type things that keep trying to take them and the seeds underground. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Okay. So two things, two things. One, it doesn't have to be bugs. It can be bears. Okay. It can like, be I... anything, but yeah, from the actual scientific world, there's plants that, attract ants in particular yeah i i i have had experience where like camping and a bear broke into a trailer to grab something um so it could be that the bear's chasing him down but i really really like the image of them having it in their backpack yeah and then a giant ant comes in and then grabs them by the backpack lifts them up and then carries them away and yeah. the rest of the party just chasing after them. Ah! <laughs> and you have to figure out why. Okay, it's called myrmacokery. The dispersal of seeds by ants. I I am cackling with delight. At... Those are fun. They're <laughs> definitely <laughs> options. <laughs> Plants are always seen as so innocuous, too. Like they, oh, we don't fear them as much as animals, but mm, I don't know. Plants can do some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, okay. now, now, now my, my brain, my gears are turning. Okay, what about triads? What about ants? Okay, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. Excellent. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yasui, for teaching us about the importance of uh, starches. No problem. And how they can be used to poison players. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're going to sign off here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening. And see you all next time. Bye. Tick monsters, sarcophagi, players' tears and wailing makes us smile. And we also do dinosaurs, yes we also do dinosaurs.